things weren't always terrible as they are now. As recent as 2018, my life was going great. I've been saving nearly 10 years to get some land of my own. That fall, a guy from work mentioned some land near him was up for sale. He drove me out there to look around. It was beautiful. Everything I'd been dreaming of. Not to mention a steel, but so cheap that I smelled a rat. I asked the guy's reason. He claimed he wasn't sure. However, the story that he'd heard was that the previous owners had a family emergency and moved east. I was still concerned I wasn't getting the full story, so I met up with the agent selling it. He told me all the stories going around were BS. The fact was, they couldn't make the payments, plain and simple. The bank foreclosed and sold it at auction. That's how he got involved. He got it for a good price and just wanted to get back his investments. It sounded fair to me. We agreed on the price and got the wheels in motion. By the end of that month, I was pulling my trailer into my new home. It would add a little time to my commute, but I wasn't planning on keeping that job once spring came around anyhow. The spread topped out at 80 acres, a quarter of which had been developed. A few acres of beautiful forest faced the road. Not until you turned onto the drive and followed it a hundred or so yards did it open up. At least a mile in every direction. If you continued down the hill, a massive pond came into view. Lucky for me, it had been stocked just five years before. This is where I parked the camper. It would be home for the next few years. In between work and the weather, I began rebuilding a pole barn to the west of the pond. When he felt like it, the guy from work would help me out. Most of the heavy equipment we used belonged to him. That first winter was peaceful. It also went by too fast. By my birthday that March, we were wrapping up the barn, just in time for me to start the garden. I had grown up in the suburbs, but one thing I knew was gardens. Our house had been on a corner lot, so was larger than the others on that street. Every spring, my dad would till up a quarter of the backyard and plant a wide assortment of veggies. He had grown up in the country, not to mention been incredibly poor. A lot of the times, their garden was the only thing that kept them alive. His dad had taught him, and in turn, he taught me. We didn't get along much of the time, but we shared a love for guns and growing food. As soon as it was dry, I borrowed the neighbor's old Ford tractor and got to work. At the top of the hill, I'd marked out an area around 75 by 75. I spent the next four days turning over the earth and adding loads of organic supplements and fertilizer. I managed to get down my seed potatoes before another storm came along. For the next week, it rained like Noah's flood. I was blocked from planning for at least another week, so I took the time to check out the far northwest corner of the property. I'd only seen it briefly that fall. It was kind of hard to get to and in less than ideal condition. The road back there was primitive. Very little maintenance had been done. Any gravel there once was had been washed away long ago. The property off to the north was swampy and no one had lived on it for ten or more years. My side of the fence, there was a wooded area around six or seven acres. I think it had been clear cut at one point. The majority of the trees didn't appear to be more than twenty years old. The result was a dense thicket of every terrible tree available in that part of Texas. This was why all the ATV tracks in the ground mystified me. My gate was little more than four lengths of barbed wire wrapped around a fence post. There wasn't really any excuse for anything better. From what I could see, someone had been going in and out of this gate with four-wheelers and on foot, and it was recently. I figured it was poachers. I followed the tracks into the trees and expected to find a gut pile. Instead, they ended at a wall of giant cedars. I stopped and scratched my head for a second. This doesn't seem right, I thought. With no better idea, I pushed my way through and came out into a massive clearing, a good hundred or more yards around. It had clearly been done by people. That explained the tracks. It had to be maintained, but why? I had a few ideas, but no clues pointing in any specific direction. One visit to Amazon and two days later, I had four game cameras on my doorstep. I discreetly posted them around the area and went about my regular work. The garden was now dry enough to plant. My week became so consumed by planting all of my favorite veggies I almost forgot the cameras. I took a quick drive down and swapped out the memory cards. There were fresh tracks everywhere. I downloaded the photos. 
There were a few men cleaning the area, trimming trees and the like, but no clear indication of what they had planned. On the upside, there was also a shot of a beautiful ten-point buck. Now I knew how I'd spend my November. I'd just have to wait and see what my visitors had planned. Another week would pass. I wasn't able to wait any longer. Just those five days, and things had changed a lot, however. It looked like an army had been through there. When I broke through the cedars, my jaw hit the ground. They had brought in buttloads of irrigation equipment and chemical fertilizer. So much fertilizer had been spread, the forest stunk to high heaven. I followed the irrigation lines through a hole in the fence. About 50 yards ahead, they led to a spring-fed pool. I'd read about stuff like this before. It appeared my friends were getting ready to plant pot on my land. A lot of it. The pictures all but confirmed this. I considered going to the sheriff right then, but thought twice. I figured they couldn't get them for anything other than trespassing as it was. I'd have to wait until I had pictures of them planning before I'd be taken seriously. A watched pot never boils, as they say, so I tried to focus on more pressing matters until then. Between seeding the pasture, maintenance on the garden, and other stuff, I stayed busy. That Friday evening, I headed out to check the cameras and almost blundered right into the growers. Instead of being careful, I was trying to beat sundown. I was around a quarter of a mile from the gate and saw a truck pulling out. I slammed on my brakes and backed up as quickly as possible. I wasn't sure if they saw me, so I pulled off into the trees and got out. Watching through my binoculars, I waited to see what they'd do. They must not have seen me. A guy closed the gate and hopped into the truck. They drove the opposite way and out of sight. It had gotten too dark, so I turned back for the camper. Since I was almost certain they didn't come around on the weekend, I returned the next morning. I brought along another couple of cameras to place inside the growing area. Over the week, a lot had been done. Hundreds of seedlings had been planted and the irrigation system set up. I couldn't help but admire the orderly way that they'd done the job, although their use of chemical fertilizers was an unforgivable sin in my book. I hid the cameras as well as I could and swapped out the other cards. Now I had all the proof that I'd need to go to the sheriff. Monday morning, I headed into town. After asking to see him on an important matter, the sheriff invited me into his office. I tried to explain my situation as clearly as possible. His smile confused me. I have proof. Loads of pictures of them preparing the soil and planting the crop. They're all in these thumb drives. I wasn't expecting his answer. Not in a million years. Son, we already know about that operation. It's been going on almost five years. This was the first time anyone had indicated they knew anything about what was going on. Hearing him say this in, in such a nonchalant manner knocked me for a loop. At first, I thought maybe he'd confuse me with another person. Oh, I, I think you might have your properties mixed up. This place is completely hidden in the woods off where no one's gone in a long time. It's probably no more than two years old. I doubt the previous owners even knew what was going on. I know they didn't make it a year. His grin grew just a bit. I was beginning to see the glint of his teeth. Why do you think they move so quick, young man? They were fully aware of it. Fact is, they're the reason we found it. They'd stumbled onto it and ran to us for help. We were ready to go in there and shut it down. Before we could, the stupid landowners get caught spying on them and were told to keep their mouths shut or else. The raid was two days from going down and I get a call from them saying that they weren't going to testify. Not long after that, they head for the hills, leaving the place to the growers. By the time I got a warrant to go in on my own, they'd harvested the crop and moved on. I'd hoped they'd left the area, but it appears they're here to stay. What could I say to that? I'd heard so much in the last few minutes, I thought my head was going to blow up. A queasy feeling began to well up in my gut. It looked like I'd gotten myself and over my head and the idea that everyone had lied to me about this place. It ticked me off. Fear, however, was a much stronger feeling right then. I told him I was going to need some time to think about it. I went ahead and gave him the drives. As I left, he thanked me and gave me one last piece of advice. Young man, these folks got a lot of mean mothers on their payroll. 
Ain't nobody going to think less of you for tucking tail and running. I wasn't sure what he hoped to achieve for telling me that. At first, I thought if someone like a sheriff is scared of these people, I had no reason not to be. It wouldn't be until that Friday that I'd understand his goal. I was pulled off the road at the same place I had before. I watched as those a-holes as they went in and out of my gate, talking and joking like it was their property, like they had a right to be there. Then one of the men took a drag from his cigarette and flicked it onto the ground. And that was the last straw. Anyone in Texas knows rain can be a scarce resource in the warmer times of year. So scarce, we often have wildfires burning out of control on a regular basis, and seeing the scum mindlessly chucking burning cigarettes down made my blood boil. By God, this was my land. I was going to do anything I could to get these trespassers off of it, even if it cost me my life. This was the moment his words clicked in my brain. Reverse psychology, huh? Well, whatever it takes. That evening, I let the sheriff know I was on board. He congratulated me and told me to stay near the phone. Saturday morning, I returned to remove the cameras. The sheriff had said that we had enough evidence to move forward. The crop was growing fast. I walked through it, stopping on occasion to admire the healthy plants. It was a shame, really. In another world, I may have been growing hemp like my ancestors did back in Virginia. This wasn't quite the same stuff, but you get my drift. However, because of our drug laws, that's almost impossible now. It's funny how life works out sometimes. Please pardon my little political diatribe. Back to the subject at hand, I got a phone call from the sheriff a couple of weeks later. It was a Tuesday evening and he wanted to prepare me. Their surveillance was done and the warrants were in order. The next morning, just after nine, his deputies and a team from the DEA raided the operation. They took about ten people into custody. I was fiddling with the fence when I got the call. I'm not sure why I thought it was all over. I'd soon realized that was the easy part. The hard part would be surviving until the trial. That morning, the sheriff told me I may be safer moving somewhere else, at least until the trial came around. He didn't have the manpower to protect me, and I thanked him for the consideration, but this was my home and I planned on dying here. I regret my choice of words now. I almost ended up dying there far sooner than I'd hoped. I hadn't been completely negligent when it came to my protection. I kept my AR ready to go next to my bed and my 40 cal M&P on my hip any time I was outside. It had been a few weeks since the raid and all was quiet around the farm. One hot evening I was in the pole barn building a workbench. I was listening to an audiobook at the time. Other than the cicadas pulsing screech I heard nothing. Out of nowhere. Complete chaos. It sounded like one of those machine gun shoots they have in Kentucky. Against my instincts, I ran out the door and peeked around the corner. The dusk was lit up by five or more rifles dumping round after round into my camper. I wanted to scream curses at them. My home was being blown to shreds and I couldn't do a thing. The mag dump continued for another minute until all went quiet and the shooters disappeared back into the woods. I didn't dare walk out into the glow of the burning rubble. My propane tanks exploded at some point, rendering the camper to a bonfire. By the time the fire trucks and sheriff arrived, it had almost burned out. Fortunately, my truck had been parked in the barn. It may have ended up like the camper. While I'm not sure whether they were trying to kill me or just send a message, I knew my life was forfeit while I stayed in the area. As the sun rose that morning, I grabbed a few baskets and filmed them with all the ripe produce I could. I loaded these along with two five-gallon buckets of potatoes into the bed of my truck and drove away. I followed the highway north and drove until sundown. A cheap motel had some vacancies. I checked in and made one my home. I stayed a week or two and then moved on. That's been my life since August of 2019. Once or twice a month, I'll check in with the sheriff. He gives me updates on the case and I let him know that I'm still alive. The wheels of justice move slowly these days. It was months before we even had a trial date. When it was finally announced, I had some hope, some goal to strive for. We were three months out when all this flu mess started. I hoped it would blow over quickly, but it looks like it's going to last forever at this point. I imagine everyone reading this is aware that the courts are shut down across the country. 
As things stand now, only God knows when they'll restart. Every day this continues, my detractors get a little closer to finding me. I have no guarantee I'm actually being hunted. Regardless, I think it's wise to live as if I am. I know every time I see a car with Texas plates, I get a little nervous. A night doesn't pass that I don't think of my paradise down south. I wonder if it's being overtaken by a herd of wild pigs or some bubba has poached that big, wonderful buck. It's great fantasizing, but for now my goal is just to make it long enough to testify. Even then, there's no guarantee I can return home. We can all have a dream, right? I only ask y'all one favor. If you're a religious person, please include me in your prayers. If you're not, keep me in your thoughts. Maybe together it will be enough to help me see my home again, and just maybe, someday. This happened in Oregon close to where I live. A friend from school had a birthday coming up. He invited a group of five of us up to his family's ranch to camp for the weekend. He was a cool enough guy and I had just gotten a K-98 that I was eager to shoot. The ranch is a big one, around 500 acres, maybe more. When I arrived, the host announced that we were going out about five miles to camp. The spot was by a riverbank and everything. We jammed our stuff into the bed of an old work truck and rode out to the site. Four of us had brought along these little two-man tents. We set them up all around the surrounding fire pit. One of the guys, Dustin, said tents were for wusses. He was going to sleep out under the stars like a real cowboy. One of the other guys quickly pointed out that he was a 17-year-old city kid and then called him an idiot, and we all just had a good laugh. I don't think he'd even camp before then. He shut up for the rest of the afternoon. Sundown came quicker than we'd expected. Instead of cooking our dinner after setting up, we went shooting. I just stuck a can of chili in the fire and kicked back. A couple of the guys had to cook their bacon and stuff by flashlight. After burning their food, they shared a Slim Jim and walked off to their tents. I did the same around an hour later, leaving Dustin to enjoy his night out under the stars. I managed to fall asleep easily only to be awakened around 3 a.m. by Dustin. It had started raining and he wanted out of it. If it wasn't so funny, I might have been mad. So much for real cowboys. Just after 7, I stepped over Dustin and out to eat. The host, Donnie, was already up. He got in the fire going and was cooking some eggs. I wished him happy birthday and took the kettle from the fire. After partially filling my basin, I return it. I poured a little cool water from the creek into it and washed up. Donnie had finished, so I grabbed his skillet and scrambled a few eggs for myself. I just ate them from the skillet like I do at home. I cleaned the skillet in a tub of fresh water and left it for the next guy. Then, I hung my sleeping bag over my tent to dry. Everyone had gotten up by now, including Dustin. We voted on shooting or fishing, and shooting one out. We grabbed our guns and walked over the hill. Three steel targets had been set up about 50 yards away. Each guy loaded up and began taking shots. I was letting Donnie shoot my Mauser as a birthday gift. I watched the hits through my binoculars. A car caught my attention off in the distance. The road looked to be about half of a mile away. Donnie didn't say anything. I assumed the road wasn't on his property. The car pulled over and three people got out. I ignored them and went back to watching my friend shoot. A minute later, I hear a whistle go past my head. I knew what it was. I was surprised a ricochet could come back that far. And just as I started to say something, another went by, only closer this time. For a second, I was confused. No one had been shooting at that moment to cause a ricochet. Then it clicked in my head. Run, man. Somebody's shooting at us. I made for the truck. I looked back and they were all staring at me. Dustin was laughing. They went back to fiddling with their guns. Another shot sent up a puff of dirt. Everyone but Dustin saw it. They also began running for the truck. Dustin must have thought it was a prank. <laughs> I'm not that stupid, guys. Nobody's even out here. Meanwhile, all of us were hiding behind the truck, yelling at him. Another round hit the windshield and made a big hole. Dustin finally realized this was real and ran for the safety of the truck. Everyone was yelling and trying to see where the shots were coming from. I peered through the binoculars and saw the parked car. I panned over to a bush. 
Behind it, I could see some shapes moving around. Not thinking, I yelled out their direction. Two of the guys opened up on it with their rifles. I freaked out. Just because they're shooting our direction didn't mean it was on purpose. The stupidity of this didn't hit me until later. Donnie and I screamed for them to stop. Then it got quiet. The shooting had stopped from the hill. We watched as they fled to the car and sped away. Everyone let out a sigh of relief. One by one, each camper stepped from cover to survey the damage. The windshield was the worst. Two other rounds had struck the front fenders. I realized my hands were shaking uncontrollably. No one had been hurt, though. That was all I really cared about. The trip was obviously over. Donnie suggested that we return to the house. I assumed to contact the sheriff. I was taking my tent down and heard, Hey, from inside. It was Dustin. I noticed a big wet spot on the front of his pants. He saw my reaction and lowered his head. I felt bad for him and stepped away for a moment. A few seconds later, he emerged in a new pair. I returned to breaking down the tent. Dustin was the last to load his bag into the truck. We had all been standing around waiting. A friend asked what took him so long. His eyes flashed over to me. He was expecting me to tell the others, and instead... I told the guy to shut up and get in the truck. Dustin smiled and jumped into the bed with us. The drive only took a few minutes. Donnie went inside to tell his dad while we waited. They came out a minute later. His dad silently looked over the damage, his jaw dragging on the ground. My God, he said. He said it so low the last words were imperceptible. You boys sure none of you are hurt? He said so loudly and fast I jumped. We all nodded our heads, saying no, one by one. He watched us for a moment, then said to go in and relax. Donnie and his dad came in a moment later. I overheard him telling his wife that the sheriff was on his way. When he showed up, he asked a bunch of questions. First among them was, why? And we had no answer. Then had us show him where it had happened. We took him out there and stayed about 30 minutes. The sheriff suggested that we all go home and inform our parents of the incident. Each of us packed our stuff up and left. My folks didn't seem to understand how serious it was. My dad just assumed it was an accident and blew it off. My mom followed his lead. That Monday I asked Donnie if he'd heard anything from the sheriff, but he hadn't. We all got busy with graduation and the shooting took a back seat. When I get time to call in, I was told no one had been identified. I lost hope for any resolution after that. Without a why, what could they do? Nothing has changed in the two years since then. Considering the state of the current world, all classes were cancelled at my college. I've been loafing around my folks' house since then. About a month ago, Donnie rang me up asking if I was up for some shooting. I said yes and drove out to the ranch. We took his jeep out to the creek. Some nice new steels had been set up. I was eager to be the first one to shoot. I was loading a magazine and happened to glance at the hill. I saw the road and it all rushed back to me. A sick feeling arose in my stomach. My anxiety must have been clear. Donnie put his hand on my shoulder and said, We could shoot from behind the jeep if you want to. And both of us cracked up and I declined the offer. His joke made me feel much better and we had a fun day shooting after that. My episode that day taught me something, however. I know now that even if you're able to forget about something scary or traumatic, it only takes one little thing, no matter how insignificant it may be, to bring it all flooding back. This was the incident that taught me you can never really truly know someone even after 20 years. When I was about five, I was shipped off to kindergarten. At the time, I was a very shy and quiet girl. I was standing off by myself when this chubby little boy approached me. We'll call him Sonny for the story. Sonny began talking to me and mentioned his family owned a farm close to mine. I was curious and asked which one. The two of us spoke together until nap time and we soon became good friends. On the weekends, one of us would ride our bikes over to the other's farm to play. Not many kids lived in the area, so it was just us most of the time. By middle school, we were like siblings. He was even my first kiss, although it meant nothing to either one of us. 
Early in high school, we'd date other people and see each other at parties. I don't think either one of us ever thought of the other person anything other than platonic terms. It stayed this way until our junior year. I was eager to go to prom, but no one had asked me. I heard Sonny didn't have a date, so I asked him. He said yes, but as a favor to an old friend. The night of the prom, some of our classmates rented a hotel room to party in. Both of us had too much to drink and ended up making out. The next day, we talked about what had happened. It was ultimately decided that we should start dating, if nothing more to make sure it wasn't the booze that caused our actions. For the rest of that year and the next, we continued dating and things went well. When the time came, we lost our virginity to each other. It was special, but the relationship didn't go on to be very intimate. We were basically the same friends we'd always been. The only difference was that we never dated anyone else and occasionally hooked up. Overall, it may have been the happiest time of my life. Sonny had always treated me well, and even when I left for college, he understood breaking up was for the best. We kept in touch, calling one another about once a month. This was how I found out that he'd started seeing one of our classmates. Rose was the same age as us and a really nice girl. She had stayed in town and was going to our local community college. When I visited for the holidays, I'd hang out with them. They made a really cute couple and I said so. Rose's past, on the other hand, was not a happy one. From what I'd heard, she'd been messed with as a child. This had done considerable damage to her psychology and she even attempted to end her own life at least once. In middle school, she was institutionalized. She returned her freshman year and seemed a lot happier. We all assumed her demons had been conquered and the self-harming behavior was in the past. This was why her disappearance and presumably taking her own life was such a disappointing thing to all who had known her. According to Sonny, they'd had a fight over dinner or something else equally stupid. After this, she became gradually more and more disconnected. One afternoon, she was supposed to be on her way to his house, but never showed up. He called around looking for her until finally reporting her missing the next morning. A countywide search was undertaken and her car was found parked at a rest stop beside one of our larger bridges. No signs of foul play were discovered, so the case was ruled probable of her taking her own life. I'd heard about it on Facebook and called Sonny to express my condolences. We only spoke briefly and it was clear her death hit him hard. The next few years flew by fast. Before I knew it, I was graduating with no real prospects. I figured moving back home was my best option. Dad could always use an extra hand. Sonny's mother, his last remaining family member, had passed the year prior to Rose. He inherited the farm and a little money. He invested in a few pigs and a bunch of chickens. And by the time of my return, the chickens were paying off. They were these fancy free-range ones that were popular with upscale restaurants. They were smaller than usual, but very delicious. He and I began hanging out again and soon discovered we still had feelings for each other. The relationship moved quickly until I was staying at his place almost every night. Meanwhile, at the same time, a new DA was elected and she had reopened Rose's case unknown to anyone. Nobody I know is aware of her reason, but it's not really important. What is, is that she had several powerful friends. With little more than a hunch, she was given a warrant to search his house. I wasn't around when it was executed. I just got a job working with disabled children at a daycare. Sonny never mentioned it happening, let alone that they found blood. Luminol had been sprayed in various rooms. The kitchen showed small amounts in the cabinets. However, the largest amount was found around the tub and drain. I walked around completely oblivious for another four months. DNA tests had confirmed all of the blood samples belonged to Rose. Once again, I was working when Sonny was arrested. For some crazy reason, he didn't ask for a lawyer immediately. He was doing well. He could have hired himself a great one if he wanted to. Instead, he let them grill him for hours. Maybe he thought he was smarter and could convince them that they messed up. If that was it... His hubris was his undoing. For over four hours, the cops hammered him. He always had a plausible reason for every question. Why was there blood in the kitchen? Maybe she cut her finger while preparing a meal. Why did we find so much blood in the shower and drain? Maybe she had a bloody nose. I wish she was here to answer your questions. This battle continued until one of the officers tried a new angle. 
Can you explain why you were seen driving Rose's car in the direction of the bridge the evening she was supposed to be missing, and then seen by the same person returning on foot the following morning? I'm paraphrasing, of course, but something like that was what tripped him up. No one had witnessed anything of the like. Sonny didn't know this, though. When he had answered, they knew they had him and attacked. Soon after, he broke and admitted to killing her. They finally had the confession they needed, but one question still remained. Where was Rose's body? Other than admitting he had dismembered her and disposed of the parts, the full story never reached the public. I only heard because it happened to be in a restaurant with a police officer involved with the case. He was a friend of ours, a few years older, and was having drinks with a group of us. He'd had a lot to drink. One of the guys nagged him for some inside information. That was when he spit it out. I personally wish I'd never heard it. To be as brief as possible after he had dismembered her body in the bathtub, he intended to bury the remains in one of the pastures. He thought it through and decided against it, mainly because he was afraid coyotes or other scavengers may dig them up. That was where our friend hesitated. Well, come on, man. Don't be a tease. Say it. We were all on the edge of our seats, and the guy pushed harder. Our friend gulped the last of his beer and blurted out, A fetter to the pigs, man. Is that what you want to hear? Your friend, a girl who'd never heard a fly, he chopped her up and fed her to his freaking pigs. We were all dumbstruck. It was the last thing I would have expected. I had had a hard enough time wrapping my head around my best friend being a murderer. And when I heard that, any shred of respect I still had for him melted away. This case had obviously affected everyone involved greatly, even this young cop, a guy who had known Sonny as long as most of us. A few seconds passed before he stood up and stormed off to get another drink. After being served, he sat alone at another table and cried for several minutes. I'd been home from work for just a few minutes when he called. I told him I'd head over after showering. I didn't give him a chance to speak. Once I'd shut up, he spoke calmly and quickly. I can still remember every word. I'm sorry, Sandy. I did something terrible. You and I aren't going to get to see each other again. Thank you for being my friend. I'll always love you. Goodbye. Then he hung up. I didn't understand. I called his house right away but got no answer, and none of it made any sense. He'd never done as much as jaywalk in his life. Then Rose's death flashed in my head. What had he done? Why would he confess to something he didn't do? I was so upset I couldn't think straight. I think I was still crying when the news came on, and I hadn't known about the DNA results. It was still almost impossible to believe he'd done it. No reason was stated, and I still don't think he'd ever given one. Since he confessed, the DA took the death penalty off the table. A deal was cut for life with parole after 30 years. I tried to talk to him at the hearing, but he just ignored me. After he'd been led away, his lawyer handed me a note. It simply stated not to try to contact him. Move on and find someone who isn't a monster. Any hope I had left crumpled in that courtroom. A friendship of over 20 years ended in the blink of an eye. The most important man in my life, bar my father. I hadn't gone over a month without talking to him since I was five. It had been a very hard loss to overcome and... I'm not sure I'll ever be able to trust again. Since the early 2000s, I'd wanted my own small-scale farm. I think the popular term is hobby farm. While I have no intention of having thousands of acres or a large herd of cattle, I am hoping to make a go of it year-round. Just as last year I found 30 acres close to town, this specific parcel had been part of a large farm, but was broken off for a member of the owner's family. That family member recently died, making way for my purchase. The house was in good shape, but the outbuildings had seen better days. I began to tear down immediately, with the help of some friends, I was able to get the hay barn completed in a fairly short order. I moved on to a second smaller storage building. The winter would slow our work, though. However, by late spring, the roof was all we had left. 
Most of it was completed when I had an accident. I was alone putting on shingles and lost my footing and fell. My arm was broken. The injury didn't stop me from working my real job. During the healing period, I took all the overtime I could. I'd been avoiding it until then, but it's nice to have all that extra money. I plan on putting it towards supplies to build a chicken tractor and some chickens. Unfortunately, during this time, I lost a family member of my own. He and I had been very close when I was growing up. Since my father spent much of his time on the road, his younger brother would help any way he could. Any major occasions my dad was unable to attend, my uncle always made sure to record it for him. It was a lot like having two dads. My mom also liked having him around. Most of her time was dedicated to my disabled sister. She feared I wasn't getting enough attention. You can see how important he'd become to my family and myself. His loss has been very hard for me. I found myself brooding on his death more than I should have until this past week when I made a disturbing discovery in the wood shop. My doctor had given me the all clear. The cast was off and I was free to get back to the farm work. My friends had finished the shingling for me so I moved on to the last job. A decent sized building used for woodworking and carpentry. The benches were still in good shape. I disassembled and stored them. After a cursory inspection, I determined the frame was still solid, so I started by pulling up the floor. The boards from which it was made were rotten and full of holes. I made it about halfway when I found an old tin box under a loose board. It was square, about the size of a lunchbox. Inside, I discovered a few old trinkets and a stack of photographs. The trinkets included some rings, an old lighter, and even a metal barrette with a bow on it. The photos had been placed face down. I pulled out a stack and turned them over. Most were nude or partially clothed young women. They looked to be from the 80s and 90s. Many were old and faded. As I flipped through, something struck me as odd about them. Soon I realized what it was. None of the women were smiling. A lot of them looked scared, in fact. I began turning them over and discovered each had a name and year written on the back. Mira, 1988, Sybil, 1991, Stephanie, 83. I counted and found 42 in total. They aren't your average dirty pictures. The models didn't look pleased to be taking them. In that moment, I had a terrible idea pop into my head. I'd seen something like this before. I watched a documentary about a serial killer. The cops had found loads of pictures in his home. Many of the women still had yet to be identified. I also remembered some killers liked to keep objects from their victims. I pulled a plain gold band out of the box. I turned it around until I saw a name engraved inside. The name matched one of the women in the pictures. A terrified blonde from 1981. A shiver ripped through my body. Had I found a serial killer's photo stash in the middle of Kansas? That's where my idea seemed to fall flat. I did some research and I couldn't find a killer active at that time, not in this part of the state. Maybe I jumped to conclusions and the pictures weren't that bad. I recognize the possibility these deaths occurred under the radar. It's just hard to believe 42 women disappeared without anyone noticing. 42? The number still amazes me. How could anyone get away with taking 42 people's lives and not be caught? That's the biggest problem with this whole theory. In all likelihood, just some creep kept his trophies under the floor of his wood shop, and that's all. But what if? Frankly, I change my opinion every few minutes. I've sat on this box for over a week, unable to decide if I should go to the cops. Just last night, I had a nightmare. A dirty old man killed a woman in front of me. I tried to tell people, but no one would listen. I woke up soaked in sweat, shaking, and that was the last straw. I've decided I'm giving it to the cops tomorrow. What happens after that is up to them. I just want to go back to my normal life. A simple wannabe farmer. However, if I ever hear anything new, I'll write an update. Just between us, I hope it turns out to be nothing. If that's what I think it is, it means somebody got away with murder 42 times and was never punished for it. That, perhaps, is the most terrifying thing.
For the last month, our farm has been under siege. While coyotes have always existed in the area, they've gotten much bolder lately. More than once, I've gone out in the morning to find tracks near my house. If they were my only problem, I wouldn't be that concerned. However, around the end of June, my kids claimed they saw pigs running around in our neighbor's woods. Stories have been going around for years about hordes of feral pigs running roughshod around the south. Until recently, we've managed to avoid them around here. I didn't pay them much attention. That was until the second week of July. I found a big mud wallow in one of my fields. Those filthy buggers eventually churned up several spots in my land before I was able to finally drive them away. The road to our inevitable showdown began a few weeks after they were spotted. It was dawn and I headed out to start my day. I was getting some chicken feed from the shed and noticed something was wrong. The garden, our primary source of sustenance, had been demolished. The pigs had rooted up or eaten a good three-fourths of it. Almost all of the potatoes, tomatoes, and squash were ruined. What wasn't torn up was knocked over or trampled. Our family saved what we could, but the damage had been done. In a normal year, it would make life hard for a good nine months. However, in our current crisis, this was a disaster. The worst of this illness could be ahead of us. If cases blow up into the millions as they did a hundred years ago, the stores will be stripped bare, much worse than this past spring. We bought as much as we could afford, but the fear it may not be enough still lingered just below the surface. When I'm made to be scared for the future of my family, I get angry. Very angry. I was determined to get revenge, and a few days later, I did. I purchased a couple of bags of feed corn and mixed it with diesel. I buried the concoction in a couple places throughout the field. All that was left was to wait. My wife made me a thermos of coffee. I took it and my rifle to the shed. I planned to sit up every night until they returned. Thankfully, I didn't have to wait long. Sometime around 5 a.m., I was jolted awake by my wife. She just woke up and saw a herd of about 7 to 10 hogs rooting on my bait. They were only 50 to 60 yards from my perch inside the shed. I quietly nuzzled up to my rifle and took aim. The first shot took down a large boar. A quick follow-up took out another next to it. They began to scurry by then, but were still well within range. My third round just missed another, but the fourth hit its target, a smaller sow. I tried to take out a few more on the move, but they were too quick. The pleasure I felt as the rest fled into the woods was immeasurable. My mother used to say, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I just made a lake full of lemonade. After we processed the pigs, I figured that we'd had enough to feed us for two years. And just one night, I went from serious fear for our future to living high on the hog, if you'll excuse the pun. My elated state wouldn't last long, though. Just a few nights later, around 10, my daughter's Yorkie scratched at the back door. I assumed he needed to relieve himself and let him out. He was gone a while, so I went out to check on him. I was sweeping through the yard with my spotlight when I caught sight of some glowing eyes. For a split second, I thought it was him, but quickly realized it was too big. Also, its eyes glowed white instead of green like those of the dog. It could only have been a coyote. I drew my 357 and shot at it. I've been carrying it since the pigs have been spotted. It ran off into the dark, apparently unscathed. I called out to the dog again, but nothing. Not far from where I'd spotted the coyote, I noticed a lump of something. When I got close enough, I could see it was the Yorkie. It looked like the coyote had killed him. Probably just before I saw it, and I contemplated burying him without saying anything, but that seemed cruel. So I went back inside and told my wife. Her and I called my daughter out to tell her. As you can imagine, they were very upset. That dog had been by her side most of her life. The next morning, I made a nice box for the little guy and we held a funeral. I buried him next to my German shepherd, Schultz, who I'd lost at 16. I'm fed up now. For the second time in less than a month, my family had lost something very important to a nuisance animal. I was determined to make that coyote pay. Like with the feral pigs, I sat up all night waiting to shoot it. After a week, I gave up. I assumed my pistol had done its job and the coyote bled out later. We hoped our troubles were finally at their end. Two days passed with no problems. Then on the third, my worst nightmare almost came true. 
My wife was preparing breakfast that morning and noticed we needed some eggs brought in. I sent our daughter out to the coop to grab some. She was taking a long time. From the window, I couldn't see her, so I went out to see what was holding her up. I was on my way to the shed and I heard, Daddy, in a low, barely audible voice. I would have walked right past had she not said something. I glanced over and saw her standing stock still. In her hands was a pail with ten eggs. At first I didn't see the coyote, even blocked by the corner of the coop. My heart shot up into my throat. I took a long, jagged breath and attempted to focus on the threat. She quietly asked me what to do. I advised her to stay still and not make any sudden moves. A long moment passed until I remembered I had a pistol. I lowered my hand slowly and quietly. When I reached the holster, I found it empty. I must have left it inside. Panic began creeping into my head. At some point soon, that coyote was going to maul my daughter and there was nothing I could do. My heart began pounding. A crazy idea came to me in that moment. I was going to have to jump on him before he could attack. I may die in the fight, but I wasn't about to let him kill my little girl. It had to be now. So I took a deep breath in and let it out slowly, and just before I pushed off with my feet, a loud bang broke the silence. It surprised me and caused me to flinch. Another quickly followed. The coyote was tossed onto its side. He didn't move after that. My daughter and I turned toward the sound of the shots and standing there was my wife holding my 357, wearing a disgusted sneer on her face. She never looked more beautiful than she did in that second. My daughter began crying and ran into my arms. I waved my wife over. We had a big family hug. Leave it to my son to be completely oblivious. He walked out while we were having our bonding moment and asked why we were shooting. I couldn't help but laugh. After everyone had calmed down, I drug the coyote to the far fence and slung him over it. It was something my grandfather used to do. He claimed it kept them away from the property. I'm not sure if it works, but at this point I'm willing to try anything. When I got back to the house, breakfast was finished. It was possibly the best meal I'd ever had. It's been almost two weeks since we've had any problems. I can only hope my animal troubles are gone. I still carry my pistol at all times. Just to be safe... We may not be so lucky again. This mess has reminded me not to take life for granted. Hold those you love close. Any second, any one of us could be lost. Every day, remind your family you love them and live each one as if there is no tomorrow. I'd only met Grandpa once before we moved in. I think I was seven then. I don't remember much from that time. When Mom and Dad passed, I tried to put that part of my life away. Eric and I were left with no other family but my aunt. She was living overseas, so Mom's dad was the only remaining option. Grandpa Mac lived on a 500-acre farm in the southeastern part of Montana. He'd been raising sheep there since immigrating from Scotland in the 1930s. When we arrived, it was lambing time. Neither of us had any idea what to do, but Mac was a patient teacher. We caught on fast. We had no choice, really. Any day we had a little free time, Mac took us hunting or fishing. Seasons meant little to him. He'd follow most of the game laws, but if he saw a big buck, he'd kill it. It was his land, he'd say. Nobody was going to tell him what he could or couldn't do. As far as I know, he never had any trouble but it was the 60s. It may have helped being friends with the game warden. That initial spring was my first time to see a grizzly. We'd ran into one on our way to the river. Even from 50 yards, its power was clear. Its size awed me. One quick swipe with its giant paws could have ripped a tree in half. No warning to stay away would be needed. Neither Eric or myself wanted any trouble from one of those monsters. Mac led us away down a new path. I wouldn't see another for almost three years. A hungry male had caught a ewe out on its own. When Mac found the body, he knew well what had to be done. He grabbed his rifle and saddled his favorite horse, Penny. I was left to guard the remaining flock. While he was away, I drove the truck out into the pasture. Eric rode in the back with Mac's 30-30 as I patrolled the field. 
No more than 45 minutes passed and I caught sight of a grizzly up ahead. I gunned it. We got about 50 or 60 yards away and I told Eric to shoot. The first shot hit but only made him mad. He roared at us and I told Eric to keep shooting. He dumped five more quick rounds in him before it fell. This great brute fought bravely but was no match for the marlin's power. The beast may have appeared dead, but I told Eric to stay in the truck. We had been watching for long when Mac and Penny came barreling over the hill. He slowed as he got closer, watching the motionless bear himself. He dismounted and drew his mauser from his scabbard on the left of Penny's saddle. I held my breath as he inched closer to the beast. He was within spitting distance when he poked the bear with a rifle. Once, twice, thrice, but nothing. The monster had truly been slain. A 13-year-old boy had fallen one of Mother Nature's greatest predators. Once I was sure it was safe to breathe, I ran over to the grizzly, Eric right behind. Mac's work-worn face wore a smile, the first and last I can remember ever seeing. I'm not sure I believe it, but I surely see it. Well, you're a man now, boy. The remnants of a Scottish brogue bled through. Despite slight pangs of jealousy, I congratulated my little brother. Mac jestingly messed up his hair and shook his hand. If I would have known this day would be the high point of our time with Mac, I perhaps would have savored it a bit more. Since everything we did was a learning opportunity, Mac drew his knife and gave us a lesson on butchering a grizzly in the field. The three of us carry the meat and hide over to the truck and toss them into the bed. While Mac brought Penny into the stable, I drove the bear bits to the house. Most of that spring, we ate grizzly in every possible way. It is certainly an acquired taste. I've had a coastal brown bear in Alaska, and the flavor proved far too fishy for me. Our bear was much more to my palate. I don't think Eric liked it much, but you ate what you were given when you lived with Mac. Besides, I think it made him proud to provide such a large kill for us to eat. Life would continue much as it had through summer and into winter. That year's winter was especially bad. The blizzard of 1969 is still spoken of today around Montana. Things were certainly tough, but Mac wasn't about to let a little snow beat him. We were all overjoyed to see the thaw arrive. Our hands were full with the lambing, but the moment we had some time, Mac drove us out to the river for some fishing. The trout were biting like crazy, and we soon became separated. I never got the full story from him, but I believe he witnessed most of what happened. We all knew that there would be grizzlies in the area. Fish is among one of their favorite foods. By this time, Eric and I had become accustomed to watching out for them. I have no doubt that morning both creatures just stumbled upon one another. If you run into a female grizzly with her cubs in tow, she's going to attack. It's surely possible a fishing rod could look like a rifle to a bear, no matter what she was thinking, Eric never had a chance. Mac was the only one carrying a weapon and it was already too late to do any good. He gotten off a few shots, but I think her having cubs along made his aim a bit wide. Perhaps, even at the time, he was reluctant to make those cubs orphans. Sure, Mac was definitely all torn up about what he'd seen. I just don't think he blamed that sow for how she'd reacted. The water was much too loud for me to hear the attack. The gunshots were what first got my attention. That haunting wail that soon followed. That's when I knew something very bad had happened. When I reached the scene, Max sat holding Eric in his arms, crying and moaning. Just the sight of it caused me to buckle. Soon I too was wailing and screaming, cursing God for taking my little brother. I begged and bargained. In the end, it made no difference. I had a large hole inside me for a long time, but for Mac, I think he died that day. I don't recall much of the rest of that afternoon. Dark was coming on when the sheriff showed up at the house. Eric was laid out on the table. I had greeted him and his deputies at the door. Mac sat silently at the table alongside Eric's battered body. I let them into the kitchen. The sheriff talked to Mac paying his respects and the like. I don't think he heard a word of it. Once the sheriff saw the body for himself, any doubt he'd had was gone. 
He soon left us alone to grieve, but the outside world kept butting in. A new person was calling every minute offering their condolences. A few of the surrounding farmers even showed up. All that pity quickly became suffocating. I tried my best to be courteous to everyone, but without Mac to help, I got overwhelmed. I finally just started asking folks to go away. Most were understanding. It would eventually get quiet at around 10.30. I made for bed not long after. Before I did, I stuck my head into the kitchen and bid Mac goodnight. He was in the process of cleaning the mess from Eric's body. He didn't bother to answer. Briefly, I considered telling him to leave that to the funeral home, but then reconsidered. It was something he needed to do, and I didn't want to take it away from him. The days leading up to the funeral, little was said. Mac would speak, but it clearly pained him. Things still got done, but I think it was more out of habit and necessity than desire. When the funeral people came for Eric, I could tell Mac had a real hard time letting go. He'd spent the day in his room occasionally talking, I think to Eric, although myself and the hands didn't mind one bit picking up the slack, I personally was concerned for his sanity. For me, work and school were a saving grace. It kept my mind off of my feelings. I know if I sat and dwelled on things all day, I would have come unwound in short order. In my opinion, Mac let himself feel too much too fast. As for the funeral and the day itself, I'm going to leave that to your imagination. Even today when I think about the ceremony and all the fine things folks said, I fall apart. Suffice to say, Eric was a well-loved young man and he was put away in a fine manner. About a week after the funeral, we got a call from Aunt Bessie. Word of Eric's death had reached her all the way in France. I didn't ask her how. She said that she'd be moving back to the States. I didn't know her well, but the news did cheer me up a little. I mentioned my concerns about Mac. She agreed that it sounded like he was slipping away. We spent some time swapping stories about the farm and our favorite places. Just before letting me go, she gave me her flight information. I promised that we would be there to meet her and we hung up. I mentioned Bessie was coming back to Mac and expected he'd be excited. He instead just said, that's nice, and went back to his paper. We met Bessie the following week. Mac picked me up from school on the way to the airport. She was nothing like I had expected. I had seen hippies on the news, but she was different. Bessie was the very image of free love, albeit decked out in the nicest of Paris fashion. I may have been a little taken aback by her style, but Bessie was the kindest of people. Her and I hit it off immediately. Once she changed into more of a rural outfit, she resembled the Aunt Bessie that I'd seen in pictures. Despite being a dedicated lover of all things French fashion, she dove into sheep husbandry head first. I had to remember that she'd grown up on this farm. Although a tad rusty, her experience was a great help. In the evening, she'd tell me about Europe and all the amazing change going on in the world. I was in awe of all she'd seen. Even after living the first 13 years of my life in a city, just a few years in the country had changed me. Occasionally, the topic would shift onto Mac. He'd improved somewhat, but the spark he once had was gone. He soon took to taking long walks in the hills. It was a definite change, but we considered it a good one. I'd always thought of the hills as Mac's church. Assume the walks gave him time to himself, perhaps to even have a cry. I certainly wouldn't have thought less of him for doing it. The walks would carry on for about a week until, one day, he didn't return. I wasn't immediately concerned. He knew that land like the back of his hand. He was also a top-notch woodsman. Staying out overnight was not a big deal, and even then, however, the other possibilities began turning around in the back of my head. There was always the chance a bear got him. The last, well, I wasn't ready for that yet. We gave him till noon before starting a search. Bessie and I split up. I wouldn't have to look long. When the walks began, I'd always assumed this would be his destination. After all, it was the source of all his grief. My fear was some animal would get to him before I could, and the closer I got, I could tell he hadn't been scavenged. Other than the little blood in his temple, he looked like he was sleeping. Just for a moment, I tried to pretend, but it didn't last long. 
This was the first time I'd cried since this mess started. I'd been suppressing it as much as stalling, and when it started, it took a long while to stop. For a long time I sat on a rock listening to the river. I wasn't ready to move him quite yet. It was the first peace he'd had in months. Just before four, Bessie came over the hill in the truck. She must have figured it all out. A few tears sat in the corner of her eyes, but actually seeing her father's body in the flesh didn't shake her as much as I'd expected. I hope he's in a happier place now. He looks so peaceful leaning up against that tree. I nodded in silent agreement. She expelled a big sigh and suggested that we move him before dark. I took him around the shoulders so she wouldn't get bloody. We loaded him into the bed and began the long, mournful return to the house. The hands were waiting for us as we pulled up. Frank, this worn-out old cuss who'd been with Mac for over twenty years, pulled his hat from his head and held it over his heart. The others soon joined him. They, in turn, each said a little goodbye and made for home. Frank helped me bring Mac into the kitchen where we laid him out. I thanked him and he also left. I sat at the table alongside the body just as Mac had with Eric a few months prior. I'm not sure how long it took for the sheriff to arrive. Bessie showed him in. He walked up to the table and offered his condolences. I now knew what Mac had been feeling. Not much of what he said registered. I silently watched as he examined the body. I felt like I was... Well, truth is, I don't remember feeling anything. The examination was brief. He said he didn't see any problems and approached me to leave me alone to grieve again. I nodded and Bessie led him and his deputies out. I knew what came next but was too terrified to do it. I continued sitting there for a long time, not saying a word. It was dark when Bessie touched me on the shoulder and said that she'd clean the body. A feeling of relief but also guilt rushed through me. I could feel myself about to break down. So I quickly ran into my room and closed the door. Mac's service was very basic and short. Fifteen of his closest friends got together at the graveside while the preacher made a brief eulogy. I handled this service far better than my brother's. I felt a duty to Mac to put on a brave face. I did almost crack up when Bessie sang The Bonnie Banks of O Loch Lamond. I never knew she had such a beautiful voice before that day. Once the service was over and the will had been read... Bess and I were left with some choices. The farm had never been much of a moneymaker. Honestly, despite being raised around sheep, she wasn't the rural type anymore. The city had gotten in her bones. She asked me what I wanted to do. I had been thrown onto the farm by fate. While I did love the outdoors and the activities it offered, I was eager to see the outside world Bessie had told me so much about. That fall, we made the decision to sell. Bessie didn't want to see any of the guys lose their jobs, so... She worked out a way for Frank to buy it on installments. She probably could have made more elsewhere, but we figured Mac would approve. Bessie and I would get an apartment in San Francisco. I'd stay there all through college until I got a job in Los Angeles. We continued to see each other during holidays. She finally got married to an engineer in 1974. They remained happily together until she passed from cancer in 1987. I seem to have caught a bit of Bessie's wanderlust. I bounced around the country, going from job to job until I started my own company in Silicon Valley. A friend of mine and I found some investors and got in right at the beginning of the 90s tech boom. We also got out just in time after selling to a fledgling Google. Once my kids flew the coop, my wife and I spent almost a year seeing the world. More times than I can count. I've told my family about my brief time with Mac, never forgetting to include Eric's great feat that made him a man. During our world tour, I took the wife to see the ranch. I lost contact with the guys around 77 or so. I was very nervous and unsure about what I was going to encounter and the knot in my stomach was proof. As the car topped the hill, I could see right off the house was gone. In its place sat a beautiful two-story log cabin. Other than that and some new outbuildings, things hadn't changed much. Driving up the gravel road, the knot grew larger. I was afraid the new owners wouldn't like some city slickers bothering them. They doubtlessly had a lot of work judging by the massive flock that grazed in the distance. I had my wife wait in the car while I rang the bell. A girl about 14 answered. 
I quickly explained that I had once lived there and was wondering if I could show my wife around, just for a moment. She asked me to wait while she got her mom. The woman who came to the door introduced herself and I repeated my purpose for being there. Something about her name seemed familiar. I didn't want to seem intrusive, but I asked her husband's name. It's Frank Hodges. There was no way old Frank could still be alive, let alone working sheep. I don't want to come off as nosy, but was his father Frank too? The lady made a kind of smile and answered with a plain yes. I felt like I was back in 1969 again. I explained that the gentleman, Max's family he had purchased the farm from, that I was his grandson and had lived here in the late 60s. Her face came alive when she heard this. Old Frank used to talk about you and your brother all the time. He talked about Mac, of course, too. Do you want to meet my husband? I know he loved to meet you. I was overwhelmed. I'd never imagined anyone connected to Mac would still be around. I said yes and naturally waved for my wife to join us. I introduced her quickly and we all walked out to this massive barn thing. A man stood talking to another. One looked identical to old Frank, minus the hutched back. I was having a hard time controlling my joy. The lady introduced us to her husband. The second he heard my name, he too came alive. A huge grin popped across his face. Oh my god. Dad used to talk about y'all constantly. Your aunt's the reason we got this place still. There were a few years Dad had trouble making the payments, but your aunt told him to send the money when he could. I heard she passed away. I just want you to know how grateful we are to her. The rest of that day, he drove us around on an ATV, showing us all the new ways of farming and everything he and his dad had changed. About an hour before dusk, we found ourselves near the river. It looked much as it had as a kid. A concerned look came across his face. I asked if we could check it out. He smiled and we parked, not far from where Eric had died. I walked off to a little puddle and crouched down to taste the water. It was just as I'd remembered. Even after all that had happened, it was just as sweet. And in spite of all the pain, I was so happy to be home again. This was the late 80s. I was working at a seed and feed store in the northern U.S., and one day I happened to notice a post on our community bulletin board. It was for a job as a caretaker on a nearby farm. This aroused my curiosity, so I called. The job turned out to be temporary, which made it even more alluring. I've been wanting to move back to Florida for some time, and the higher pay would make that possible, and sooner. The number on the posting actually belonged to the owner's children. They needed a caretaker to fill in for their elderly father, he had a stroke the month prior, and it was expected it would take six to nine months, possibly more, for him to rehabilitate. In the meantime, he'd be living at a rehab facility, so they were looking for a single person or couple to live on the farm. There was no crop to plant or harvest, only a pair of horses that required basic care and exercise whenever possible. I provided a brief list of my past jobs and a few references. They promised to get back to me soon and hung up. It was almost a week until I heard from them again. They wanted to offer me the job. Naturally, I took it and moved in that weekend. The place wasn't anything fancy. A modest three-bedroom home and a couple of large outbuildings built on 125 acres. My day consisted of mucking out the stalls and providing fresh food and water for the horses. When I finished that, a few times a week, I'd saddle up one and go for a ride around the property. This was all before lunch. After, I'd take care of some little things in need of fixing. If there wasn't any work left, I'd pass out in front of the TV until dinner. Overall, it was a pretty cushy job as farm work goes. The owner's kids would call or swing by on occasion, but I had the place to myself for the most part. I'd been there around seven months when my prep for lunch was interrupted by a pounding on the door. I answered and was greeted by a swarm of guys in suits and FBI jackets. They handed me some papers and said that they had a warrant to search the property. I had no idea what to say. So I told them the circumstances and that I had to call the owner's family. They seemed a bit miffed, but understood. 
I rang the family up and they told me to let them do their job and to stay out of their way. They'd contact their lawyer and he'd handle it. I said okay and let them do their thing. They appeared to have been looking for something in particular. The house was left alone. Instead of searching any buildings, a truck with a trailer carrying a backhoe drove toward the back of the property. They passed out of my view and I returned to making my lunch. Cars came and went for the next few hours. I dozed off in front of the TV. Later that day I was awakened by a ruckus out front. I peeked out the curtains and saw a swarm of news vans and cameras camped out in the front lawn. One of them saw me and shouted, There he is! I was still groggy and had no clue what was going on. A group of reporters and cameras rushed towards the window. I jerked the curtain, closed real fast and returned to my post on the couch. I flipped through the channels until I caught sight of the house. What exactly was happening wasn't clear at first. I wiped the sleep from my eyes and turned up the volume. On the screen, an anchor was talking to another guy over the phone while footage of the farm was being shown. The man over the phone mentioned a guy who had disappeared some years prior. A member of the mafia, supposedly. Then footage switched to a helicopter view of the back field. A bunch of the same FBI guys and some state police officers were standing next to the bobcat. Next to that, a big hole had been dug. A helicopter scanned over from the hole and we saw two black bags laying next to another on the ground. To anyone who's ever seen one, they were obviously body bags and they looked to have bodies in them. My jaw must have been dragging on the floor. I felt drool rolling down my chin and wiped it away and I was freaking out. What in God's name have I gotten myself into? I needed some answers and needed them now. I called the family back and told them what was going on. They said that they were aware but not to worry about it. I wasn't in any danger, legal or otherwise. I was told to stay in the house and to not talk to the media. They had been notified and I was not involved in any way and should be leaving soon. None of this made me feel any better but there wasn't much that I could do. At least at that moment. I hung up and went back to watching the news coverage. As the hours ground on, the story became clearer. The bodies belonged to two mob guys who had disappeared a few years earlier. The scariest part was the revelation that the nice old man who owned the farm was actually a long-time mob associate. The entire mess had been twisted into knots. I tossed and turned the whole night. I couldn't decide whether to quit or stay on for the remainder. The world of organized crime was foreign to me and something I had no desire to be involved in. On the other hand, this was my dream job. I had been treated well and had seen no sign of criminal activity. Even as I dialed the phone that morning, I wasn't sure what I would say. However, the moment they answered, my mouth made the choice for me. I said I was calling to let them know that I was giving my one week's notice. Any longer was just out of the question. While my time at the farm was wonderful... The recent events were playing on my mind heavily. The owner's daughter was who answered. She tried to talk me out of quitting, but I guess she could tell that I was afraid, and she quickly relented and thanked me for doing such a great job. I briefly felt a tinge of guilt, but my brain took over. I thanked her and we ended the call. The media had moved on as well. So I was free to finish my week in peace. The feds must have gotten all they needed that first day. There was no sign of them after that. I rode one of the horses down to the gravesite the next morning, mainly out of curiosity. The hole had been filled in and other than some tire tracks, the area looked normal. I don't know what I was expecting. I soon lost interest and returned to the stables. The morning I moved out, the owner's kids showed up to give me the rest of my pay and say goodbye. They were going to stay at the house until they found a replacement. I recommended a few people and provided their numbers. We made some small talk until I'd loaded the last of my things. They wished me luck and I pulled away. I pointed my truck south toward Florida and arrived a few days later, and I'd been here ever since. I'd intended on ending it here, but I realized some of you may be wondering what became of the case. Well, the fact is, I had no clue until I read up on it prior to writing this. It appears nothing would happen for a long time. The feds had some suspects, but no one was talking. Then, just after the new millennium began, they got the witnesses they needed. A slew of gangsters involved were convicted and will likely die in prison. 
The family who owned the farm, I have no clue what became of them. The job was great and they treated me really well, but that's where it all ends for me. Behind closed doors, they were into some very crooked stuff. Stuff I didn't want to be roped into. I'm a simple fella and my life had been great since. I don't regret leaving that place for a second. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt.com. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, if you're a rim eater, then you're a bottom feeder. <laughs>